a waiting list for transplant, and then they're tiered according to sort of how sick they are. And there's three statuses currently. Now, there's actually this is under review, and some of these are going to change. And um, but here's are some of the criteria for uh, uh, how they are. So 1A is sort of the highest risk, and they get the highest priority. And these are patients that we think are the greatest risk of death. So they're on uh, the inotropic medication or sort of continuous IV medicines to help the heart um, function better. That they are on these medicines at a moderate to high dose or they are on a mechanical ventilator, or they are on a mechanical pump to support their heart. Um, that would give somebody the highest risk. There are some other factors for congenital heart disease patients, but I didn't. Uh, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Then there's sort of the next status, that's 1B. These are patients that are inotropic dependent at a lower dose, or, or their uh, very young patients can qualify this, and patients that are failing to grow. And then there are status 2 patients that are not uh, meeting criteria for status one. As it turns out, uh, currently um, we do very few transplants as status two. Uh, most of our transplants, uh, certainly in our center, are either 1A or 1B, and, and generally uh, there are exceptions to this, but if a patient is well enough not to be a 1A or 1B, then they may do well without a transplant. There are many circumstances where uh, we feel a patient should be a 1A, um, but they don't particularly qualify. Uh, a patient with restrictive cardiomyopathy would be a good example for this. Um, and we can petition UNOS, which is the, excuse me, the agency you know, which oversees organ transplant, and say, look, I know our patient doesn't qualify, but we think for these reasons they should be a 1A or 1B, and you know, goes to a committee and they, they say yes or no. In general, uh, in my experience, uh, um, it's rare that we are not successful in, in petitioning for higher status, but there's certainly no guarantee about it. But there are certainly many circumstances where a patient would be at a higher risk but doesn't qualify, and so there is some room to, uh, you know, to be reasonable about it, that these are not you know, uh, you know, rules that are set in stone without any exceptions. And then, uh, you know, and then once a child is placed on a wait list, uh, you know, I think this is a this is a nerve-wracking time. I, uh, well, all, I think probably all the period of heart waiting, thinking about a heart transplant is nerve-wracking time. But an appropriate donor can become available at any time. You know, it could be, you know, I've had it as soon as a day and as long as over a year. And um, and the duration is variable and it's difficult to predict. I mean, there are you know ways to predict these things, but but in the you know in the end it's it's a you know an average is an average and half the people are faster than that and half the people are longer than that so it's um you know to be able to say to somebody well your child's going to wait a week or a month or six months is is uh, is really a guess at best um, how centers manage patients while they're on the wait list is really variable from place to place including you know how often they're seeing them what they're doing and uh, um, so, uh, but in general, they're followed, you know, very closely because they're, you know, these are sick patients. If they weren't sick, they wouldn't need a heart transplant. And then one thing that I think is important to know is that uh, uh, a patient may be listed at, as more than one center, and you certainly have a it would be your right as a, a, a patient to uh, to look into this. It becomes somewhat hard uh, for heart transplants, um, be, in some ways because of how long um, you have once the heart is um, obtained um, to how quickly it needs to be implanted. Um, this is much more common in things like uh, kidney transplants where there can be much more time and people can you know, really travel around uh, the country. Um, but it is something that, that can be worked out. Um, we have had patients listed here and at other centers, um, but it's, um, it, it's not a common thing in, in pediatric heart transplants. Uh, um, because of you know just some of the specifics that are involved with it, but it's certainly uh, something that if you're interested in it, it's worth talking to your transplant center about if if they think that's something they could accommodate or not. And uh, one of the things that I alluded to before is that um, there's no guarantee of of surviving while waiting for a transplant. And uh, you can see from this slide. You know the status 1A patients. So these are the sickest patients. Um, uh, they're they're listed in blue, 
and you know that line going down that's showing that these patients are are at a significant risk of of dying while waiting for transplant whereas the status 1b and 2 patients you know they're certainly not without risk um, but um, uh, but but the risk of dying uh, is is not uh, trivial and and just among the status 1a patients um, what type of support they're on really matters. So this uh, green line is neither being on ECMO, which is a type of um, mechanical support, um, which is you know, sort of full heart and lung support, which generally is not very effective for uh, much more than a very short period of time. So if they're not on this or on a ventilator, so meaning that they're on you know inotropic medications generally, but are breathing on their own and are up and moving around. Well, they, they're, you know, the risk isn't zero, um, but it's much better than if they're on a ventilator or if they're on ECMO, where the reality is if a child on ECMO uh, doesn't have a heart uh, available to them, really within a relatively short period of time, um, they're unlikely to uh, survive not only to transplant, um, but then after transplant. So uh, one of the most important things that we can do for a patient while waiting for transplant is to keep them healthy, is to uh, make sure that their, if their heart is failing, that the rest of their body is working well, that their kidneys work, their lungs work, they've got good nutrition, uh, you know, they're up, they're moving around, and that's really important. And if we can achieve that, then their likelihood of doing uh, good with the transplant is so much better. So that's sort of this purple bar here um, and we can see that among all groups of patients um, the risk of death after transplant if patients go in healthy in this purple area is, is good so if they're on you know inotropic support but they're pretty healthy well they're um, uh, they're uh, uh, you know have a, have a good chance of getting through this hospitalization the I don't know what color, magenta color, uh, there these are the patients who are uh, really sick otherwise, so their kidneys aren't working, their nutrition's bad, their lungs don't work, and their risk of death is, is really high. And that's the highest, if you look at this last group here, this group on ECMO, if they're on ECMO and, and they've got you know, multiple organ systems that aren't working, well their risk of, of, of not surviving, even if they get a heart transplant, is very, very high. So again, the, the best thing that we can do for a patient when they're waiting for transplant is keeping the rest of their body as, as healthy and, and in good shape as we can. So how do we do that? How do we keep a child well while waiting for transplant? Well, we really want to optimize their activity. You know, the worst thing is, is laying in bed all day long. It's, it's not good for you. So, you know, up, moving around as much as possible. Uh, to optimize nutrition, you know, it's really important. You know, a, a transplant is a big surgery, and and to heal up from that well, you know, you need good nutrition. And, and as good as nutrition as we can going into it, it's very important. Making sure all the other organ systems are working, you know, kidneys, liver, lungs, all that stuff working as good as we can make it. And for some patients, and for more and more patients, um, we're really using a mechanical support. Uh, generally, it's not ECMO, but in these uh, so-called ventricular assist devices, uh, these mechanical pumps that can um, um, help uh, help support the circulation. And these are some of these pumps that we have. And you may or may not have heard of these. Um, the Berlin Heart uh, was a revolutionary device, um, which we started using in the United States, uh, really in the early 2000. It can support uh, either the left or the right side of the heart, uh, or both. Um, here's a picture of a patient on that, and it, you know the pump sits outside of the body, so they, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing, and you know, you we have them walking around with these. Um, and there's, a, you know, just a picture of the inflow and the outflow graph, and and the pump itself. And when we compared this to patients on ECMO, uh, it was really not comparable. The patients um, that went on one of these Berlin Hearts did so much better. So we can see again the patients on ECMO. Uh, virtually uh, nobody survived after you know two to three weeks of therapy. So if a patient didn't get a heart very soon, they really didn't do well. Uh, versus the Berlin Heart, which could really support these children for much much longer as a bridge to heart transplant. 
Um, for older children, um, there are, are different types of pumps. This is one of the pumps that we use here called the Heartware. And unlike the Berlin Heart, this pump is entirely inside of the body. You know, it's relatively small, so it's an adult-sized person's hand there. But you can see, you know, the device just sits in the palm of the hand, and uh, um, uh, it can be uh, in, inserted in the heart, as that other picture shows. And people have used these down into you know, relatively small children. Uh, um, uh, I think some centers have put them in as young as three or four. I think our youngest patient was five, uh, who, who did very well on this device. So while these devices weren't designed for kids, um, they weren't approved for children. They were, you know, they were designed for adults. Uh, but we've been able to use them uh, very safely and effectively for um, for children, and it's been a, a very good device. We're, we've been uh, very happy with it. Uh, there are other types of pumps. I didn't, you know, mean for this to be a talk on just these pumps, um, but other types of pumps that we use here and other people have used. Uh, this is called a total artificial heart. So this would be in rare conditions when an isolated pump. Uh, wouldn't work, and we needed actually to remove the whole heart and replace it with two mechanical pumps. Um, uh, so this is an un, uh, rare scenario where we need to do this, but um, if you need it, it can be a very effective uh, therapy. And there have been cardiomyopathy patients um, that have been treated um, with these. And, and we're using these pumps um, more and more over time. So this was a study which we did which just looked at children's hospitals throughout the United States. And you can see, uh, you know, from the early 2000s in that first column to the later 2000s here, this blue is the number of VADs that were placed. You know, many more VADs were being placed in the last several years. And the overall um, mortality is, has really gotten down. Um, over time, and that's especially true at the places that are putting in a, um, a lot of VADs, that uh, the the outcomes are are, are really um, are very good. And one of the things that are important about these devices is that they can really help keep a child healthy, get them out of the ICU. Um, we've sent patients home on these devices as well. That some of these devices are are good enough and durable enough that patients can be home. And then they can really, you know, be active, get good nutrition, um, and enjoy uh, some period of time out of the hospital um, before their transplant. Uh, uh, we have more devices in development all the time, and this is a device which has been developed for uh, infants. We hope and it's called the pediatric Jarvik device, and you can see, you know, this is the size of a paperclip, and this is the size of the pump, and uh, this was put together as part of a, a trial um, and a program sponsored uh, by the National Institutes of Health called the Pumpkin Program. And we were hoping that we could study this device actually last year that we would be ready uh, to study, um, but there's still some work that needs to be done and some more um, experiments in animals um, and some more testing that needs to be done uh, before we think we're ready to uh, to, to uh, attempt this in, uh, in children, uh, but we're hopeful. We're hopeful this will be a good device um, and, and will give us some more options for our youngest, uh, our youngest and smallest um, of children. So I was hoping to leave some time uh, for questions here. So, um, so to summarize, uh, you know, heart transplantation can be a very good therapy for patients with end-stage cardiomyopathy, and it can offer long-term survival with a good quality of life um, but unfortunately, it is not a cure. Um, in, in preparing for transplant, uh, you know, we in every center would have a formal evaluation process. And the listing um, status uh, really determines the priority for organ allocation. And during this time period, uh, you know, it's important that we try to keep the child as healthy as, as possible um, so that they can undergo their transplant and do well in the long term. All right, well, I thank everybody for listening to me, and um, I'm certainly happy to, uh, to take any questions you may have. Thanks, Dr. Rosano. That was great. Um, wonderful information. Um, we do have uh, some questions. Um, the first one is, um, could you comment on um, if, if the child is kept healthy, will they likely um, qualify for status 1A um, since we – we want the patient to be healthy and mobile, but to in order to receive the heart and qualify, they need to be um, the sickest as well. So, if you could comment on 
on yeah, that? that's an that's an excellent question. So if you meet um, the one A criteria, which currently could be you know like on one of these inotropic medications at a dose, then then you stay a one A, even if you're otherwise doing well, and you can actually be at home on on you know we 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 send you send some of our patients home on these medicines. Um, a patient on a ventricular assist device um, uh, keeps that 1A status even if they're at home and doing well. Now some of these may change over time and there's actually right now some proposed changes to the policies where some patients may not uh, you know, keep that um, for the whole time but that's, that's, how, that's as it uh, currently is. It's a, it's different in adults. Um, they won't keep that status for forever. There's it's a it's a time limited thing um, because there again I mean, there are many many adults you know waiting and you know they're they're an unlimited number. But um, but yeah. But anyways, if you meet the criteria, then you're one A as long as you continue to meet the criteria. If you're otherwise healthy, great. That's what we want. But but you you still will stay as a one A. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question is, is it common that if a patient um, undergoes a transplant evaluation at, at one center and is determined to be not eligible for a listing, um, should they be advised to go to an alternate center for further evaluation? And is it common that this would happen where they would be listed at one center and, um, and considered eligible for transplant and not others? Yeah, you know, that is an excellent question. You know, I wouldn't say that it's it's probably common, but it definitely it definitely happens. And I think that, um, uh, you know, seeking another opinion is uh, maybe a very good idea. I think it, 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 um, it sort of, de you know, depends on the, on the situation. Um, um, you know, oftentimes, um, oh, it's hard to, there are many reasons that, you know, a, Somebody may say, you know, we don't think you're a candidate here, um, but um, uh, uh, but those, you know, another center may may think about it a little bit differently, and so um, you know, seeking alternative uh, opinions, especially if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't make sense to you, or or you think, well, uh, you know, I'm not sure that makes sense, or, or or maybe it makes sense, but I'd like to hear what these other guys have to say as well. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea to do that. Um, you know, we we see second opinions. I'm sure other people see our second opinions as well. Um, if a family ever asks me about it, I, I encourage it. You know, I certainly, you know, um, you know, through this, you know, we all want the same thing uh, for the child to do as well as possible. Um, and I, what I want for you know my families also is that whatever decision you know we make, you know. You know, we got to be comfortable with it and, and and live with that decision for good or bad. And uh, um, if if another opinion helps to get that decision, and if following that other opinion's advice is the way to go, well then, well then great. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I, I if it ever comes up, I think I generally encourage to, to to seek a second opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, there's there's another question. If if anybody um else has questions, um please type them in. Uh, if you think of them, uh, there's one more question, and then after that, there's none. Um, there's there's no more in the queue. So if you have any last minute questions, please type them now. Um, but if you could um talk about a little bit about who um who comprises the evaluation team and the transplant team and and um and and how that works as far as the different roles of of um. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that varies a little bit from center to center. But it's a it's a it's a multidisciplinary team, which is the which is the the hallmark of it. So at our place, we have our you know our our our, our uh, cardiologists, our surgeons, you know, looking at the medical and the surgical aspects of it. You know, we have a relatively big team with also you know uh, you know transplant nurses, nurse practitioners. We have our um, you know social workers and psychologists. As well, um, um, meet with the family. We have evaluations, you know, from like our infectious disease experts as well. There may be times when another person, you know, if there's a, you know, again a cancer or something, and, and we're not, you know, uh, to have, you know, our, our oncology doctors as a part of this to say, well, look, this is, 
we think this is cured, you don't need to worry about it, or I think the cancer may come back, and at what risk is that, and, and, and how will that weigh in, or if there's other, you know, if there's other, you know, other sort of opinions and things like that that we need to to get that, that we may bring in, but but that other is sort of the sort of the core group. But but it really it should be a multidisciplinary team. Um, this is something where it's it's not one per you know it's not one person's decision. You know, I may say this is my patient, I want him transplanted, but I I can't I can't make that happen, you know, I, it needs to, you know, the committee needs to agree with me and, and, um, and make sure that, that all those things fall into place and that it makes sense to do so. Thank you. Um, there's one more question. Um, if a teen has a transplant and then requires another transplant as an adult, will, will they have prior, any priority in the adult setting? Good question. Unfortunately, no. Um, um, it's 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 really age based and um, and so um, there's not children do get a priority for like pediatric organs so that that can definitely be helpful for adolescent patients um, so you know if there's an if there's a you know a, you know a 17 year old donor um, you know an adult sized person but but still a pediatric patient that organ um, would would go preferentially to a child versus an adult. Um, so that's that's something that unfortunately, um, uh, if a patient was getting a retransplant as an adult, they would they would not fall under the adult criteria and not get that preference anymore. The whole algorithm is actually a very complicated. You know, it's a it's cued by by um, by how close you are as well. You know, blood type goes into it, so it's a fairly complicated sort of algorithm that they run and you know it's like a couple pages if you look at it but those are the things that sort of you know, factor into it okay thank you so much um there's there's no other questions um uh currently so um so i think that 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 does it for the questions um but um Dr. Rosano has also graciously agreed to um uh share his slides for for those who were asking about it um uh, so if if you need this copy of the slides, um, we can send them to you as well uh, after the presentation is over. Um, so, Dr. Rosano, we wanted to thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us tonight. Yeah, sure thing, of course. So I hope it was uh, I hope it was useful, and um, yeah, I appreciate everybody's uh, taking the time out tonight to listen in. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great and very, very helpful and very informative. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to our audience for your attendance and participation tonight. Um, there's a very brief survey that should pop up at the end of the webinar. So if you can take a few minutes to provide your feedback, um, we would appreciate it. And also, as a reminder, September is Children's Cardiomyopathy Awareness Month. Uh, CCF is celebrating the month with 30 days of activities, which include circulating facts about the disease, sharing stories about cardiomyopathy families, planning community events, and generating media coverage to raise awareness. Um, this year, CCF is also adding a walk for a cure to bring the message to more communities. And so far, we have 21 teams registered uh, throughout New Jersey and across the United States. Um, the walk will take place on September 27th. And um, it will be a fun family day. And uh, we also have virtual walkers who are joining us from all, um, all locations throughout the country. So for more information, please visit our website, which is childrenscardiomyopathy.org. Um, and again, we thank you all so much for your participation and support. And thanks again, Dr. Rosano. Great. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Thanks. You too. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye.